streaming. So hello everyone, uh, my name is Kim. I'm going to be moderating the next panel, our first professional panel. Um, I am very excited to announce our professional speakers for this year's conference, and I would just like to say before they start, a huge thank you for um, taking their time out of their busy schedule to come speak with us today. Um, the panel will feature um, a selection of speakers uh, who work in the art scene in Montreal um, in varying areas. I uh, will feature um, Director of the Folk Gallery, Jennifer Dorner, um, Chief Curator and um, Director General of the Montreal Museum of Fine Arts, Natalie Bondil, Dr. Christian Seltzer, Founder and Director of the Convergence Initiative of Perceptions of Neuroscience, and our history professor at the University de Montréal, Dr. Emmanuel Bicha. Um, so we will we will begin today with the presentation delivered by um, Jennifer Dorner. Thank you very much, Kim, and to the organizers of uh, the conference for inviting me. I'm happy to be here. So, as was mentioned, I'm here from the FOFA Gallery at Concordia. I'm just curious to know how many people have been to the FOFA Gallery in the audience. Okay, Thanks everyone, that's fantastic. Um, so you'll see a picture of the FOFA Gallery here. It's the uh, street level storefront gallery on St. Catherine Street. Uh, I started working there as the director in 2014. Um, and the mandate of the gallery is just below. So it's really a space, it's the primary venue dedicated to showcasing the current artistic and research practices of the Faculty of Fine Arts. And so we do exhibitions, we have panel discussions as well, um, performances, all kinds of events. And really the mandate is focused around promoting the work that's happening within the Faculty of Fine Arts. Um, but there is a little bit of space there um, in the mandate which is that we also present work from beyond the university community when it relates to the research and pedagogical aims of the faculty. And so for me, that was the, the interesting place and allowed for a little bit more um, freedom in terms of what kinds of curatorial initiatives I could take on and what kinds of programming, community outreach, uh, how can the gallery become a bridge to the broader community, um, which is extremely exciting when it's in this very amazing location on St. Catherine Street have such a broad range of people that walk by. And so it was really interesting for me to think about how we could um, maximize the location of the gallery while respecting the research and, and inter research interests of the faculty. Um, and when I saw the this conference description, I was particularly excited because of the, the, the description, in particular um, looking at how art has often been used as a tool to respond to instances of rejection and segregation, um, and also that this conference would foster dialogues that unpack the varying degrees and forms of alienation in art um, through critical discourse on art and spaces of exclusion, politics and activism, and so on. And so I thought I would just spend my time um, speaking about one particular initiative um, that came about in 2016. Um, some of you may have been around at the time in Montreal. Uh, there was a very controversial uh, incident of a racist film having been shown at a screening in a, in a festival in Montreal. Um, it was a film by Dominique Gagnon called Of the North. How many people are familiar with that particular controversy? So, about half. Okay, so I, I think it's important to talk a little bit about it. Um, it was a film made by uh, a white um, Quebecois, um, and he appropriated footage, video footage, from YouTube of uh, works made by, some works made by Inuit uh, in the north, and uh, basically a compilation of footage from, from many places, but it was called Of the North, so it was really, uh, the filmmaker really wanted people to read it as something that, that represented the north. The reason why it was racist is the way that the film was composed 
uh, it showed things like a child, uh, an Inuk child playing, to suddenly a teenager being drunk and you know wandering the streets. So it, it depicted a lot of Inuit uh, drunk, irresponsible, um, just all of this, the worst kinds of stereotypes that you could imagine. Um, and it was extremely upsetting to my Inuit friends in particular who heard about it and when they watched it, they made them physically ill. It was that upsetting. So the debate continued in the cultural sector in, in Quebec. There was a lot of media coverage. You can, you can look it up. Um, there was a lot of social media debates going on. A lot of my friends in the cultural sector were, were talking about censorship and freedom of expression. We talked about ethics. Um, but there wasn't really anything concrete. And I thought that the role of a gallery in a university setting is to take advantage of this particular context um, and bring in as many perspectives as possible into a panel situation where we could discuss, we could debate, we could pull up all of the information, all of the feelings, all of the emotions, and, and discuss it at length. And so um, it was a, a very heated discussion. Um, in, in terms of the panels, we were lucky that Alethea Arnaku Beryl was in town. She was at the time editing her film, Angry Inuk. Uh, Heather Igloliorte, some of you might already know her as well. Um, and Stefan Pushkash, who was an Inuk activist in Montreal who really uh, took on the debate um, full force uh, in Montreal and beyond. Um, we also had Marie-Pierre Boucher, who was a postdoc at McGill um, in art history. Um, and Mathieu, uh, Mathieu, Mathieu Grandin, yeah. Mathieu Grandin, who's a filmmaker in Montreal. And so it was very challenging for me to, to get that diversity of, of perspectives because it was such a heated debate. But we came together. Uh, it was supposed to be an hour and a half to two hours, but the audience was full. It was a sold out event with people lined up to try to get into this, um, to participate. And it turned into a three hour discussion um, it was a very important discussion in terms of talking about the ethics of film production, but also uh, the ethics around uh, what works do we prioritize and give the platform for presentation. Um, and so, in the end, it really we you know the the topics that were discussed were really about why is it that it's white people uh, making work uh, about indigenous people without indigenous people, and so what we have heard a lot since then is you know, nothing about indigenous people without indigenous people. And at, in, at the end of it, uh, Alethea and Heather had prepared this incredible resource. It was a list of films made by Inuit filmmakers on one side, and on the other side of the page, it was a list of films made by non-indigenous people, but made in collaboration with Inuit to show the incredible works that had been done. Um, so I, after that, I talked to Stefan and I said, Stefan, what can we do as a gallery? How can we um, support these kinds of films? As a gallery, I think we need to do better at creating space and ensuring that there's space for these kinds of works as well. And so out of that was born the Tili Tarnit Festival, the film festival. Um, so Stefan, uh, that you see there, and myself, and Isabella Wieda Luktuk uh, were the co-curators. And Sarah and myself, we're, we were the support. So as a non-Indigenous person, I really had to think about how my role was in all of this. So um, really, I was the one making the photocopies. <laughs> I was the one doing a lot of the heavy lifting in terms of the administration. Basically, I, I did my best to make sure that Stefan and Isabella's dream curatorial program would be achieved. And one of the things that I really wanted to make sure was that the audience was not white people, because we see that a lot where there's films about indigenous people and it's presented to a white audience or a non-indigenous audience. So we worked really hard because it was the inaugural thing. We had never done this. It was very experimental. How do we achieve this? And Stefan and Isabella said, well, let's, let's do what we always do in the Inuit community, have country food, which is the seal and caribou, um, and we will play games because we love games in the north. They had amazing games. Uh, we'll have music. It's a very artistic region. So we had um, games and food and music, and we welcomed a really uh, incredible audience of uh, Inuit and non-Inuit. It was a it was a mixed crowd, which I think was very moving for the 
uh, organizers, Stefan and, and Isabella, because they had rarely had an, an event where there was really a balance there in the audience, which we managed to achieve. And, and to be honest, it was really the country food that was the big seller. Um, having seal meat flown in from the north, uh, fresh with caribou, um, was, you know, as soon as we put that on the posters, they came, <laughs> which was amazing. So here, here they are. Um, on the first night, feasting on um, that's the seal there, um, which I had to pick up at the airport <laughs> in a giant frozen box. So I, in the process, I did many, many things that I had not done previously, and it was quite an incredible celebration. And I think because of the controversy previously, I think people had a lot of emotion uh, in in the audience. They were extremely happy to see themselves represented on the screen, and they were happy that, that they were the ones telling the stories. Um, so it was a huge success. We had Beatrice Deer uh, performing. She is a local Inuk musician. Um, incredible. And then, I'm just jumping ahead, it became, it was such a success, we thought, well, let's do it again. Um, and we did get f uh, money from the Montreal Foundation to host a second one, and we thought, let's, let's go even bigger and do better. So this is Isabella Vidalitik, who curated the second iteration of, of the festival. And we created this giant banner because we thought there's a really large uh, Inuit population on in this area, actually, uh, in Cabot Square and all along St. Catherine. We noticed that there are a lot of Inuit that walk in, up and down St. Catherine. So the best way to promote this event was to create this giant banner. Um, so it was produced by Barry Pottle, who's a photographer based in Ottawa. He's an Inuit photographer. And it was really important, aside from Sarah and myself, to have all of the contributors, all of the artists, the curators, even the staff working uh, on during the festival were all Inuit. Um, and it, yeah, it was wonderful to have that. Um, so here's here's an example of how it kind of looked in the space um, with, with some of the crowds. So we began every evening with the feast, uh, the music. We had several performers. Um, I, Oh yeah, we also invested in a freezer, so now we both the gallery has, we have our own uh, two tiny freezer where we can store the meat. Um, and so here are the, the present presenters. Um, on the left is Nina Segalowicz, who um, told an incredible story about her experiences um, as someone who um, is from the 60s scoop. She had been also in the media quite a bit recently with the settlement that had uh, been attained just in the last few months. Um, so she told her story, and she's also a throat singer. So she did an incredible performance. Okay, thank you. Um, throat singing where she actually, in the beginning of it, she said, is there anyone in the audience who could join me? Any other throat singers? Uh, and a woman, actually a couple of women were like, yep. <laughs> so they came and they, they sang with her. Um, and then on the second night, we had Kelly Fraser, who's in the middle. Um, she's incredible. She was just nominated for a Juno Award, uh, which is really exciting. She sings a lot of pop songs, um, some very familiar, that she translates into Inuktitut. Um, and she also writes uh, her own music as well, um, and sings in English and in Inuktitut. And uh, on the final night, uh, it was Takralik Partridge. Um, who is a, a poet and, and performer, and so she, she performed that evening. We had a bit of rain, so we were inside for that. Um, yeah, so it was an incredible um, success. Um, we had so many people, because it was in the courtyard outside, we really maximized that space, um, and we had a lot of people who were just happened to be passing by who joined us, as well as the, the people who came back each night of the festival. Um, partly for the food and the games, um, but also to watch the films. So we, we really learned a lot. I think I learned a lot in the process. Um, coming from two years ago, literally coming on two years now, I, I knew very little. And uh, in speaking to a lot of people, I realized there's a whole ge geography in Canada, that whole northern section, which is the biggest part of the country, I knew very little about it. Um, and so, I thought it was really important to, to understand and learn it as a, in a curatorial role. How can I, uh, what is my role in that? How can I make the space uh, and invite other people in the community um, in a way kind of using my position to make room and 
let other voices uh, take over. Um, so it's one of the things that I thought, thought related to most in terms of your own conference topic. Um, and one of the things that we're most proud of, and I have Karen Tutanuak, who's here. She's right there. She's now um, taking over Isabella's role in terms of helping us with the program for the coming one. So we're planning another one in August. Um, this, this time the theme uh, is storytelling. So each year we've kind of taken on a different curatorial theme. And this year Isabella and Karen have been working on that. Uh, so we'll have an exhibition component as well, uh, as well as bringing in storytellers from the north. Um, and films, animations and stuff as well. So really looking at uh, works that can relate to all ages. So uh, I think we're going to really target families. Um, so a very different audience than what we normally would have on the inside of the gallery. Uh, but still very much of interest, I think, academically. But also in terms of um, inviting people who are living outside of the university uh, walls as well. Um, so yeah, that's it. Thank you very much. So I'm um, super excited to be here and be talking with some of you guys. So I want to thank Kim and Kuya for inviting me to talk to you. I have some stuff to share. And um, my talk is, uh, uh, that's my name, Christian. <laughs> I'm the director and founder of Convergence Perception of Neuroscience. And uh, this is the, su the subject of what I want to talk today, the gap and the bridge, uh, a science art unification. So, but before to start to talk about this, I want to talk a little bit about what science does. I'm a scientist, I work in a lab, and do science. Science work basically building knowledge in facts. So what we do is we observe nature, and from the observation of nature we create hypotheses. And what we try to do is falsify those hypotheses, so to try to disprove them over and over and over with uh, experimentation. So when this falsification doesn't work and you go over and over and the evidence start to grow, you start to see you have certain body of literature that talk about how nature behaves. And this happens in door senses. So what you see here is some very well-founded facts like the planet is getting warm, and it's not safe for you to have guns at home because instead to protect you, probably will you will finish killed by one of them. And it's good that you get vaccinations because they actually can save your lives. And GMO food are actually safe, and they are not bad for you, and they could solve problems like starvation in some countries. Now, what is interesting about these particular facts I'm showing you here is that they are being denied for some parts of the population based on fears, based on different facts that are not related with what science has discovered that is building tons of information. Now, this is not something we are actually is leading to something that people is talking today about post-factual era of science journalism. And why this is uh, a reason to be worried about, because these particular facts can influence in the decision that politicians have and the decision that society take. If we don't listen like the planet is getting warm, we continue doing what we are doing, Montreal will be underwater, two or three meters of water, in a couple of decades. If you don't get vaccinated, you will get spread disease and you will get sick. If you don't believe that guns are dangerous, 
you will finish what was happening to the United States. So these kind of things are important, and it's hard for us as scientists to arrive to the public. Why? Because we scientists use facts, and facts are cold, and cold is not well received and perceived by human beings. We work better with information to learn what is related to emotions, and here's where we want to work with artists to get to those emotions. Now, what is very interesting of all this is that science and art used to be just one discipline. They used to work together. There used to not be difference between both of them. And this changed in a point in time that we know as the age of alignment. That started with the thinkers of Descartes, Hume, uh, Bacon, who started to outlay what is known today as a, the scientific method. And this was an effort for scientists to try to get as near as possible of what reality was through <coughs> certain type of research, getting away from emotions, getting away from bias, to try to resolve problems in nature. What you see here is the first photography that is known in history. It's called View from the Window at the Grace from 1826. And it's exactly an example of what science provoked in that time the revolution of the industrial revolution that make the gap start to go further. Now, why this is important? Because um, in that time, art as a critical society saw the point of human scientists getting away from humanity, getting away from feelings, getting away from emotions, to try to reach precisely this um, more real uh, representation of, of nature. And the movement that came with that was the Romanticism, which changed the things and created that. Now, here's a quote from Frankenstein, from Mary Chile. It's alive, in the name of God, now I know that it feels like to be a God. And this is what precisely this movement was representing, was telling us to careful scientists think that they are like God. They are going in lands that are forbidden, that used to be just the land of God. And this create uh, a gap. That is why the title of the, the conference is The Gap and the Bridge. A gap between not just the arts and the sciences, but also a gap between the sciences and society. So, and this is still very early. So, what I will show you here is an example. This is <coughs> Mr. Luigi Galvani. Luigi Galvani was the first person that showed that the impulses and the nerves are uh, driven by electricity that they come from the, from the brain and they go through the nerves. So he showed it in a very particular experiment that is still today is done in, in schools that is put a current in a frog leg. You can see the frog leg moving and it's part it do for what I've told you before. Now immediately after, in that time, people start to go in first and see actually cadavers being coming to life, moving just by putting electricity. And as you can imagine, this also trigger one of the most amazing movies that we know today. <laughs> Actually, not movie, a book, right? Frankenstein from Mary Chile, which was like 30 years later after Vinny Galvani, and was actually a criticism of what was happening with scientists who were believing and going to, to, to the land of just God was before, putting the hands in things that were forbidden, and bringing things that were terrible. And this was mad. And there is where it came, the mad scientist. So now, the thing about this is it didn't stop there. This was the first step of the criticism. They got to come further and further, and bigger and bigger. Ah, yeah. <laughs> so now let me show you something. This is very interesting. This is just three months ago. In the left side, you see a video from Boston Dynamics. It's a, it's a place in Boston where they do research with androids, in artificial intelligence. In the other side, in the, in the right side, you will see a video from Black Mirror, Metalhead. Let's go. There you go. So, in this side, you see the research of robots trying to enter in spaces and collaborating to go in rescue missions. In the other one, you see the dark side of what could happen with these robots. This was three months ago. Every time you go to the comments in the section of Boston Dynamics, people instead to say, like, wow, this is wonderful, is terrified about this. They fear that what will happen is what you see in the other side of the screen. So 
The stereotype and the fear that population feels has been fired since long time by literature, by movies, and by television. Now, this is something that doesn't stop it there. And then you have all sorts of stereotypes that go from almost 100 years ago with mad scientists in different areas of science, biology, physics, robotics, artificial intelligence, even bring to the comedy. So every time I talk to a person and say, I'm a neuroscientist, they say, oh, I'm a scientist. And it's true. That's what they tell to me. I'm not mad. I love what I'm doing, and I put a little reason in that. So now, this brings the question, is something that we could do together to fix this gap, make this bridge? Because as I told you before at the beginning, we have this crisis of people denying facts, which actually affect society. So what we neuroscientists and artists have in common? Is anything that we can work together? Is any parallel? I can tell you there's many parallels. And the biggest point of union that we have is um, our brain. So we use our brain to create art. We use our brain to create facts. And in this, if you study a little bit the brain, you realize that one part of the brain works to create reason. This is the prefrontal cortex here, in the front of your head. That area works making a combination of maths, making reasoning, taking facts and putting them together, and making reasonable them to planify for the future. That is for what is used. Now, this area that has to do with the reason is useless for everyday decisions. Why? Because everyday decisions use another part of the brain. If you take a brain and you just look in the middle of it, you will realize there is the prefrontal cortex again, but you have all this blue part that's called the limbic system. And that system is related with emotions and keeps you alive every single day. This system has to do, like if you are crossing the street and you see suddenly a car coming, you listen to the car, you will jump, your muscles will get tense, and boom, will save your life. So this system has different parts. Um, one of them coordinates, as I said before, visual, uh, hearing, auditory system. Another one coordinates fear. Another one coordinates that fear with how the muscles react and how your glands react. And another one coordinates how you learn from these experiences. So what is interesting is both systems are related in the cortex. So we need both of them to create what we are, human beings. So what teaches us? That the brain were balanced in a dialogue. It's not one side and not the other. And we should learn about that lesson. Art and science can work together to solve problems today. And I have an example of that. So this is convergence, perception of neuroscience. This is what we are working since 2016. I have the honor to work also with Kim in this. And what we do is take neuroscience students and fine art students and match them to work together in a transversal collaboration. What does this mean? The neuroscientists don't come here to teach the artists, and the artists don't come here to lecture the neuroscientists. They learn in parallel, they share information, and they create a project together. The project is basically, with the neuroscience research, answer a question in art, and create a piece of art based on that. So for that, we have the amazing collaboration of, of what happened? Oh, there you go. Of Concordia University, the brain uh, and program from the Research Institute of the McGill University Health Center, the Canadian Association for Neuroscience, and the institution that you see below between them, the Visual Voice Academy. What we did was create a program where That started in 2016, where, okay, there we go. where we start with talks from the neuroscience students, final talks about their work, then we continue with the work about how the neuroscience uh, work, the basic of neuroscience, and then we continue with how the contemporary art work, so we both could learn about these things. And in 2017, we started with a course uh, offered here in Concordia, in the Faculty of Fine Arts a dark course, and we have final talks from the artists, 
and then also talks. There you go. Talks about the net sensory system, and oh, and talks that finish at the end with a big exhibition in two fan art galleries. So what I want to show you now is how this project uh, finished. So the people that you will see here are the different groups that work and produce the pieces of art that you will see in each photography. Meanwhile, you see these photographies of these groups, I want you to ask yourself, which one is the scientist? Which one is the artist? If you can distinguish between them, then I have a problem. If you cannot, then I have been successful in taking these two groups together to work and create art based on science in a transversal collaboration. So I will leave you, after I show you all the pictures, of all these amazing students and the amazing art that they produce in three and a half months <coughs> with a quotation. Let me just write there. From Sir Francis Bacon who said he said arts and science should be like mines where the noise of the new works and further advances is heard on every side and this is what I'm expecting that we do again during this year. Thank you. and uh, for showing your activities with the Convergence Initiative. Um, I would now like to call upon uh, Director General and Director of the Montreal Museum of Fine Arts, Nandi Bundil, for um, an interview uh, to speak about her career, uh, reflecting on uh, her own curatorial work. So if you could please welcome her. So much so interesting, but I'm French, so uh, in France, uh, in fact, uh, I was born in Barcelona and grew up in Morocco. But when you are, want to be a curator in France, you have to pass some competition. This is the law, you know, in France, administration is very strong. So uh, I did my studies uh, in art history uh, in, um, at the Ecole du Monde, and then I passed the competition at the Institut National du Patrimoine, National School for Heritage. And so I'm still a silver servant. So I still belong to France. <laughs> uh, then, uh, in fact, normally when you pass this uh, examination, uh, you have a job until uh, the end of your life. But a um, few of us, uh, among uh, 1,000 people, who decided to leave. I came here just for experience, experiencing the, the city. And I really, uh, it has been a great, great um, inspiration, inspirational place for me because the way how we work here, the way how we can uh, um, really activate uh, our profession is totally different because we work, we work for the society and work with the, uh, with the citizen 
directly with them, volunteers, etc. So it changed completely the way how I envisioned my uh, my job, and uh, it's still a very uh, strong inspirational place, I must say. Quebec, Canada, and uh, Montreal. Just Definitely bringing your identities with you um, as you come to your Well, I think that the point is not really to bring my identity, but really uh, to be uh, open to other identities. And here it's uh, much easier because uh, I think that uh, people are much more open-minded. Uh, I do think that Canada is a very modern country, and uh, in fact, uh, it's uh, easier to make. Uh, changes happening in our society. It's, uh, it's exactly what we want to do. It's exactly what you say with, the, uh, with your trip. So uh, it's, uh, it's a place where we can uh, really uh, have an impact and uh, we can innovate. Uh, so uh, we have uh, many uh, collaborations with uh, Concordia, as you know, with uh, our therapy, uh, on, uh, with uh, many social uh, uh, collaborations, etc. So. Uh, uh, really, uh, it, it's a great place when you want to initiate uh, programs. This is a good country. Um, and actually, speaking to collaborations and what you've done with the Montreal Museum of Art, um, I was wondering how, through your direction, you would say you impacted how the general public engages with the arts, and specifically in introducing the more multidisciplinary programming with um, music, different world cultures. Um, and so on. Mm -hmm. so you speak to that. Yes, thank you. Uh, I was very much interested by art and sciences. It's exactly what you uh, you showed to us just before. In fact, uh, uh, art is um, for me. I think that our collection is a uh, visual encyclopedia, and this is all about the way how you learn and how you see the arts. But if you have uh, of course, okay, there is a scholarship, and I don't want to, uh, to talk too much about that because uh, I'm sure that you know that, uh, uh, like me, but uh, as much as me. But I think that uh, the way how okay, we have this great collection at the Montreal Museum of Fine Arts, we are very really privileged because it's not our mandate is as no boundaries, so we can really. Uh, uh, invite uh, all kind of arts and artists, cinema, literature, uh, but also I think that uh, we can also uh, innovate uh, by inviting sciences and uh, by all kind of new collaborations. It is just the way how you uh, see the art. Um, and uh, for example, I don't know if you saw uh, um, a big project we just uh, launched, uh, Educar, Educart. It's also uh, available in uh, English, both languages. And in fact, for this project, we went through Quebec in the 17 regions, and we uh, created, uh, during four years, uh, one uh, project about uh, everything but history of art. So that was really my point. I say, I really want to have our uh, collection um, uh, in uh, each region. So uh, I hire uh, teachers, and uh, they work with teachers, and they co-create uh, uh, different um, programs in each schools about ecology, feminism, uh, freedom, um, body, etc. And each uh, uh, each time on each subject, they use works from our collection because, of course, uh, the the goal is really to to make this collection more relevant for the new generations. Because uh, this is really my my job to, to uh, be a creator is really to. To, uh, to transmit an heritage uh, to, uh, from our ancestors and to the uh, uh, new ger generations also. So, uh, and uh, in fact, uh, those, uh, uh, we invited uh, mathematics, uh, we invited the biologists, we invited 50 experts, uh, uh, more than 50 teachers, uh, uh, we, uh, 60 uh, <coughs> students, we did uh, 15,000 kilometers for this. It's a very, very big and ambitious uh, project. So this is exactly the kind of thing I love because I think, well, uh, uh, and it's fact, it's uh, what we want to do now with the uh, Wapikoni Mobile, as you know, and uh, we also want to the north uh, for this uh, project because we, want, we really wanted to have the, each region. Uh, at the very beginning, um, the, the minister told me, well, we, we know that you like education, but what do you do uh, for uh, the whole Quebec. I say, okay, 
watch me go. <laughs> <laughs> so we decided to, to go everywhere. So it has been a fabulous uh, adventure for the team. And now we, of course, we want to continue because we have 17, because we were in 2017. Uh, but uh, with uh, Wabi Goni Mobile, so we can do the same thing okay, in uh, different communities. So it's endless. So when you adopt this new way to see art uh, by inviting, by opening your doors to all kinds of uh, 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 different experts, you learn you and, uh, and uh, you co-create new uh, program and it's, uh, I think it's a win-win situation, so it's great. And um, do you think that technology plays a big role in um, both communicating with other disciplines and getting them involved with the arts and sharing this with the public in turn? Uh, definitely, yes, uh, there are tools. Uh, for example, we could not have uh, done this uh, project without uh, uh, new uh, technologies because this is a way how we can uh, reach uh, to the people, we can bring our collections to a very uh, uh, far away communities, as you say, uh, Canada is so big, even Quebec is so big, it's really for me coming from France, it's uh, four times bigger than France, you know, so it's, uh, it's really challenging to, uh, to, to live here in, uh, in Canada because we have those, those huge distances and we are always uh, discussing about how can we bring uh, art, artists, etc. Uh, through Canada because uh, uh, very often it, this is a main issue for uh, producing project and for, uh, so we really have to, uh, technologies can help us very much. And what do you think is one of the biggest obstacles in, in achieving that goal of getting the general public to engage with these permanent collections um, at the museum? Um, I, I, I don't see things in, uh, uh, in very negative. <laughs> uh, what would be the main issues? I think that uh, it's uh, we, we must be very uh, uh, empathic, uh, empathetic. It's very important, and also not. I do not think that uh, one size fits for all. Never. So I think that it's very important to understand what uh, the, uh, who is the public, uh, what they want, and not because you want to uh, deliver what they want, but exactly because uh, we we create each program specifically for each kind of public. For example, uh, you know we have uh, more than 450 uh, partnerships with all kind of uh, people, associations, institutes, uh, a 50, pro uh, 50 uh, research program with universities from Quebec. But each time, what is important for me say, well, for example, I want to reach a uh, public with Alzheimer or um, elders or uh, autism, etc. So we don't know where are the, those public. So, uh, but how could we reach those public? How can we? Uh, so we invite experts, and uh, then we listen to them. Those experts are their own public, and we have with this great uh, collection and the great and uh, the museum, which is a fabulous platform. And so we co-create each program, especially for each group. It's a lot of work for the team, I must say, because uh, it's a lot of work, because it's always haute couture. I, I think that ready to uh, wear is not the best way to think. It's really haute couture each time. So we really have to be very, very uh, uh, empathetic and always uh, accept to change what does not uh, work. Mm -hmm. So well, I'm, I'm not saying that uh, we always achieve, but uh, we try to do our best. Um, as it seems, you have definitely succeeded in recent projects for um, yes, for the some, museum. for the not. <laughs> <laughs> Depends, but we are still, but we are very determined to do. With some, because sometimes uh, we want to create some project, but it's not very uh, uh, easy. For I, I can talk. With, we have a project with the, uh, the Institute of Cardiology with Dr. Tardif. So, is a, and but uh, in fact. Uh, uh, it's very long because uh, it's a very uh, specific and very. Uh, um, it's not uh, as easy as uh, we would have liked to uh, 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 to imagine this uh, project uh, within our walls, but uh, we are still working on it. It's, uh, I always say that try for ten projects, at least we have five. <laughs> always. So. The great so mentality. Yes, <laughs> it's good. Because when you don't try, you never know. You know? So it's, uh, it's better to, to, to 
to, uh, and also to push the initiatives uh, from the whole thing, because everybody has an idea, so it's good better to, to push on them. And um, going back to when you, you mentioned that you see museums as these visual encyclopedias, um, and you had mentioned in an interview in 2015 that um, they also help us behave like humans. Um, and I was wondering what you thought the museum's role was in connecting with and influencing the public. So not just having them engage, but having an influence, I guess, on, on their behavior. On the social, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, uh, definitely. I hope that uh, not only we have uh, culture should be as important as sport for me. This is very important. And uh, I'm still uh, fighting a lot uh, for uh, for our cause because, uh, for example, look, now uh, we're discussing with the Minister of Education and I can see that, uh, unfortunately, because art uh, does not play uh, together, uh, we, uh, we lose some uh, place uh, in, uh, in schools, uh, on the contrary of sports. So uh, now uh, there is a coalition for art, uh, as you know, so they, they try to uh, we are rather proactive and looking for this coalition because we want to push the art uh, as a group, not uh, theater against dance against. It's exactly what we did, in fact, at the Canadian Council for the Arts because we really wanted to have this uh, uh, synthesis and just to have one goal. And uh, I think that not only art and museum could be a, a, a Social platform for uh, in, uh, a platform for social improvement uh, for two reasons. First, because uh, I, I think it's very important to educate the uh, emotional intelligence, especially now we are talking more and more about artificial intelligence. But uh, well, we can have uh, great computers uh, in our hands, but we still have very uh, um, related and even uh, sometimes slaves uh, uh, of our emotions. And emotion is not uh, always the best advisor. So I think that when you are in a museum, uh, you are in a place where you can objectivate, you can uh, have you know, this kind of context which can help you to understand from who we are and like, where we are going. And it's, it's a great place, especially for visual art, of course, because uh, the uh, harassment of the, uh, uh, the uh, images is so strong uh, now. So uh, this is why we work with the uh, scientists, uh, chief scientist in Quebec, Rémi Carillon, and we have this committee, Art and Sciences, uh, in our uh, museum, and we have uh, a different kind of uh, innovating project, I must say. And on another uh, um, level, I think it's also a great place for social improvement, because we can also connect with all kinds of groups. Uh, uh, our uh, main priority was uh, education schools, then it was art therapy, you are a great partner, but now we work, uh, we'll work a lot for diversity and uh, togetherness with a new wing you want to open next week. Uh, next week, no, <laughs> this is my dream. Uh, next year, no, 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 in fact, it's not a dream, it's a dream. So it will be next year. <laughs> next year. And so, uh, and uh, because it's, uh, uh, it's, we need to, yes, to, to improve ourselves on, on such, uh, yes, topic, sorry. Oh, so too much. No, we, I mean, I can speak for myself, I think we all appreciate you coming on. Um, but on that note, um, we just would like to thank you for participating in this conference. Um, we are out of time, unfortunately. Um, oh, sorry. Can you stay for the Q&A? We have one more presentation, and then we'll be an open 15-minute Q&A period if anyone else has any questions. Um, I'm very open. If you have any kind of question, or ne never hesitate. It's very easy to contact me. Um, so, so uh, you can just... Uh, Email. It is true. Huh? <laughs> um, so again, well, thank you. Thank you um, very much. We will conclude with our final speaker, Dr. Emmanuel Licha, and then we will open a 15-minute Q&A with the um, four professional speakers. So thank you.
Hello. Thank you so much for the invitation. Um, I'd like to talk today about places, about what is contained in places, um, spatial objects, as well as um, human relations that are contained in these places. And I'd also like to talk about uh, the influence that places have on uh, the representation of events, and more specifically, on the representation of conflicts. So, I will give some examples uh, that come from my work as a filmmaker and a visual artist. What we know about uh, conflicts and most other political issues is mostly meditated by uh, the representations of events produced by a vast array of uh, protagonists, so both journalists but also military and journalists uh, and also citizen journalists. And more recently, by anyone uh, basically owning a, a smartphone. Um, even though we are exposed to a constant flow of those uh, reprint representations, we know only very little about the conditions in which uh, they are produced and circulated. And as much as violence is uh, connected to territories and to sites where it is uh, perpetrated, uh, the representations of uh, violence are also embedded in spatial and architectural uh, structures uh, through which they are uh, mediated. So I will talk about a few uh, projects i done recently. Uh, and you'll see that most of them I adopted a kind of um, what a sociologist called, uh, Arjuna Padurai called a methodological fetishism, uh, which uh, would consist in following uh, objects, believing that uh, inanimate objects uh, have a certain agency, uh, they have an inherent power, uh, and that they co considering that they can tell something uh, that go beyond themselves. So places are structured by behaviors and rhythms, they have a history, they involve practices, and they are in, in constant transformation. Simultaneously, places uh, structure and um, condition human relations. They are not only uh, the sole background of human action, but they are also a, a provocation to uh, some human actions. And what's interesting as a filmmaker about places is that they contain this impalpable information, but they also have a, a materiality that can be observed, um, studied, manipulated, uh, transformed, and even, of course, filmed. So places are useful anthropological tools uh, to study at close range uh, human transactions that define uh, aspects of uh, society and shape events. But as a filmmaker, um, the question I have is uh, how do we make those places or those spatial objects speak? I mean, we know that the table or chair um, cannot speak, so we need to have a, a kind of a strategy, we need to have a plan. How do we make them uh, deliver this invisible uh, information? How do we make them tell a story? Um, so one way of making them tell a story is to, to describe them um, using uh, all kinds of techniques. So I will maybe not go deeply into that today, but uh, I will refer to recent projects. With this one, I filmed a few years ago in a training camp of the US Army. It's, uh, it's in California, it's in the Mojave de Desert exactly between Las Vegas and, and Hollywood. Um, and this place in the desert is uh, made of, of 13, if I remember well, uh, mock villages, uh, representing uh, some Iraqi or Afghan uh, villages from Afgan Afghanistan. And those villages, those training camps are uh, used for soldiers to get accustomed to the reality uh, they were about, they're about to explore. Uh, when they are being deployed in Iraq or Afghanistan. So it took me a long time to get permission to go to uh, these places. Um, of course, I thought this the information was uh, secret and very confidential. Uh, but after a few months, uh, I finally got that permission. And I went there for a week. And this platform, this observation deck, is the play first place where I've been uh, taken to. I wanted to go there without cameras. I usually uh, approach a new place just observing and not without immediately not with filming 
immediately, but I, I was forbidden to do that by the, the press officer that was uh, with me all the time. He said, you have to film that. So I understood that actually this, this village was not something so secret, uh, but it was something that was, uh, I was expected actually to, to film. Uh, and from this observation deck, I could have a, a very good view on all the action, and that's also where uh, officers would go and direct uh, the action. So in this place, you have um, extras. Uh, so many among them are hired from uh, the uh, Iraqi diaspora uh, in San Diego, and they are hired to play their own role. So this village is looks very much I mean, as one that can one can fantasize Iraq uh, with shops, uh, with a mosque, uh, with a police station, and some some political uh, office. And those two actors are uh, just uh, pretending to be one of those uh, activists. Um, so they are playing their, their own roles, of course, uh, dressed in a way they probably never uh, dressed uh, when they were back. Back in and this is um, one of the tallest buildings in the village, and it's a hotel. Uh, surprisingly, uh, I was uh, invited to stay in that hotel for the duration of my of the shooting of the film, and I, I occupied the, the room on top. So you, can, you can have uh, a look at this room. Uh, Inside, and it was it was very interesting. It was it was the only building that was that had furniture. The other, all the other ones were just containers, um, and this one had uh, air conditioning. It had a bed, it had a chair, it had uh, everything that you would find in a hotel room or a motel room. Uh, the only strange thing is that it didn't have any curtains, um, and it, it was a bit annoying because it was so bright outside. But I thought. They want to know where I am, so maybe they didn't put in curtains, so you can check uh, when I'm in the room or not. And I was sitting on the, on the on the bed. That's where I took this this picture, looking at this window, and I had the feeling that it, it was uh, quite similar to a movie screen, a television screen. And I, I was taking some papers. I didn't have a meter, but I measured that that window and. It, did have the exact proportions of a TV screen, 16 by 9. So I understood that this hotel room was suddenly um, the, the kind of a frame for me. Uh, by the way, I was always considered by, by the army as a journalist. They didn't have an artist or filmmaker in, the, in their list you know, where to, uh, to, to, uh, to write that, that function. So they treated me as a journalist, and that's where journalists uh, stay when they, they cover uh, the events of the, of the camp. So I understood that this room and the hotel was the frame, and I only had to uh, put on my camera and start filming, because it was situated on the best uh, place of the, of the village, right, um, where the mosque uh, is. So from that moment, I decided to take the military uh, proposition seriously and to consider that hotels uh, do have a role in warfare. I mean, we, we know that they're not the most funny people, and they probably didn't do that um, you know, out of leisure. Uh, so they, they, there was probably an idea which I decided to, to follow. For, so during approximately five years, I, I dedicated my project to uh, studying the role of hotels in warfare. So what I called uh, war hotels, or those uh, hotels that are used by journalists when they, when they cover a conflict. And my first um, step was to, of course, understand those places when they are in use, so during conflict. And in 2011, in June, uh, the first Syrian re refugees were starting to arrive uh, in Turkey, um, and they, they were crossing the border near Antakya, and for a few days I saw that many um, articles and reports were coming from, from that city, so I, I decided to, to go there, um, and what you see on the, on the left side is one of the very first camps. At the time, everybody thought it would last a few days, a few weeks, and people would go back uh, to Syria. Uh, you know, it's not uh, 
the case. Um, but that's the <coughs> furthest I, I, I could go. I could not cross um, the border. And already at that time, uh, journalists were using um, footage filmed by um, Syrians themselves. You, I mean, they would give cell phones to Syrians to, uh, who would be living in that camp or would sneak through the border back uh, in Syria at night to see if their, their house was still uh, okay, and they would use this footage. So it's really an important date in terms of journalism, because as we know, uh, journalists are uh, nowhere to be seen uh, today in Syria. It's really too dangerous. But still, um, I continued with, without any kind of nostalgia, I continued looking at this uh, role of hotels, because it's, so, it's been so important for decades, and still is. Um, so I, I traveled to different places uh, after the fact. I understood when I was uh, in Antakya that you know, filming the works of journalists was not really the point. I, re I was really interested in the, in the object itself. And I traveled in Antakya on a very low cost uh, flight. And I, I, I thought it was, I was quick. I went there, organized my trip in two days. I was already a few days late. Journalists were, were there. And uh, I had this uh, cheap ticket. I couldn't change. It was you know, uh, all the, mon the money I could afford. And after two days, all the journalists left. Of course, you know, it was you know, already boring to cover uh, Syrian uh, refugees. And I was left alone in that city. So it, it, I went from a very hectic, mediatic hall to a total uh, de desert. Um, and I was left alone. And it's at this time that I, I could reach uh, all the hotel, uh, hotel owners, uh, staff, or the fixers, everybody that had been so busy around uh, the past few days they were now free to talk. And I understood that that was the, the proper moment. One friend, um, I told that story to one friend, and she answered. I said, I came too late, and I left too late. And she said, of course, artists are always too late. And <laughs> instead of, of being insulted, I thought, OK, maybe that's the right temporal uh, 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 framework for, for, my, for my film. Instead of think, thinking that being too late is always means to be behind or not to be aware, I think I could use this being late as something productive. And that's what artists do. They are late, and they are you know, very lazy, but that it, it gives them um, some something to, to think about and to reflect uh, upon uh, the events uh, of the world. So I remained late and went only after the facts, after the wars, in Sarajevo, Beirut, uh, Gaza, uh, Kiev, where the, this picture was taken, and uh, another city I, I forget, that great, um, to uh, cover um, I mean, to look at those uh, places and interview the, 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 the staff. So the film uh, called Hotel Machine uh, is shown in uh, festivals uh, since uh, two years. And it was also presented last year at the Musée d'Art Contemporain uh, in Montreal as part of a, an installation in which I, um, I presented the, the film in the, the central space. Uh, surrounded by five different, uh, what I call stations, and each station was um, uh, presenting one role of the war hotel. Um, so I will go quickly uh, through the, those roles. Um, I have five minutes, it should be enough. Thank you. Um, so, war hotel as um, point of view. Um, so. In each station, you would have various archival material examples. Uh, so as much as, as the, the film uh, worked from a kind of meta hotel, I, I combined in the editing all the places I, I mentioned. So when you watch the film, you never really know where you are, if you're in Beirut, uh, Gaza, or, or Sarajevo. Not to say that they're all the same, but just to concentrate on that spatial object, the, the hotel. Whereas the installation goes into specific uh, cases. So for example, in, in, um, in Egypt, in Cairo, uh, 2011, uh, all the images, most of the images that we, we saw of Tahrir Square were uh, taken from um, those, uh, those hotels, which I, I, I found on uh, looking at, at the images and, and uh, finding them on, on the map. 
Um, we know this very typical way of, uh, uh, of listening to a report. You, you have the journalist in the studio, the other one is live you know, on uh, his hotel balcony, and I used this example. Um, so it's from Arte, there, there, was, there used to be a German um, version and a, and a French version, and the German version, uh, uh, which was filmed before, uh, shows the, the, the frame of the, of the window, and probably someone in the studio said, are you crazy? People will understand that he's in his hotel room and he has a, you know, this life vest, uh, this vest, um, bulletproof vest, um, and it doesn't make sense. So just it just zoomed in, and um, in the French version, they eliminated eliminated the, the frame. Um, I have many examples. Maybe I, 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 I will uh, give you the catalog. To, to <laughs> um, so that's also in Italia Square, the, this hotel uh, on the left, the Ramses Hotel. So hotel as war hotel as point of view, war hotel as Proximity, of course, the journalists need to get, you know, this famous quote by Robert Kappa, if, you, if you're not, your image is not good, that, that means you were not close enough, something like this. So they all believe that, of course, so they want to get as close as possible, but sometimes being close doesn't mean to be close to, to, to the event, or it, or it could seem like they're close um, to the event, but they're actually stuck in the hotel, and that was, for example, the case in, in Baghdad, where the situation outside was so dangerous, but still they managed to film this very um, uh, symbolic image of the statue of Saddam Hussein falling, but knowing that there were, you know, thousands or maybe not thousands, hundreds of statues in the city, this one was chosen because it was just in front of the hotel where uh, journalists were staying. Um, in Beijing in 1989, um, after the massacre on Tiananmen Square, uh, journalists were told to stay in the, their hotel. They could not go in the city anymore, uh, but that's from uh, four different balconies and those four different journalists took this very famous uh, picture or footage of this, um, what they call the tank man. Uh, but very often journalists are stuck, very typical image um, that we get. Uh, they are stuck in the hotel in Tripoli was the case, they could not go out of the hotel. Um, they were surveilled by minders. Minders are government um, people working for the government that accompany the, the journalists um, and make um, sure they don't go out of the hotel or out of their way. Um, third role of the hotel was the war hotel as <coughs> security. Uh, so journalists, we also do tend to think that hotels are, are safe. Uh, people thought it was the case in Tripoli because it was so close to the, the power. Um, this woman uh, also uh, thought it, it was. She, she reached the hotel uh, hoping she would be safe and be able to tell the story she had to tell. She was raped uh, in jail and uh, she wanted to uh, tell the story to journalists staying at the hotel, but the staff of the hotel just took her away, just put a, a hood, that's a CNN footage, we see hotel staff putting a black hood on her head and taking her away. Um, war hotel as communication. War hotels are places where there is technology, there is uh, these, uh, tele, 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 uh, telex, uh, now it's, uh, it's internet, uh, and this is one of the reasons um, uh, journalists choose to go there. They are also conference places, and people go to hotels to gather information, uh, civilians go there to exchange information or to give information. Military go there to to, to meet uh, politicians. Politicians meet journalists. So it's really a gathering a place. Um, go a bit. That's a, an announcement. Uh, after this woman was taken away, the hotel uh, sent this um, this press release. And finally, uh, because of all those roles, the four roles the War Hotel as a hub, so a place where everybody uh, meets, and even in the case of Kiev, where uh, the dead are, are, uh, are, are how do you stored, how do you say, do you store dead? No, no. Anyway, uh, where uh, the, the, the lobby of the hotel became a, a kind of a hospital uh, where the priest would also go. Um, so, um, 
of course, this, this question of the, the, the war of terror, as I said, we know that less and less, most of the images we get from Syria today are, come from citizen journalists. Um, and I, I wanted to conclude on, on, uh, on, the, on this idea of, of double shooting. Um, we know that uh, the model of the war hotel is now very uh, influential in the way citizen journalists uh, film conflicts and the way they, 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 they broadcast their work. Uh, so potentially the, the unique model of the war hotel, very central in the, in the city, where journalists would go and film the entire uh, event, all the events. Uh, now we can consider that you know it, this model is scattered all over the city and potentially from every building and from every window from, of these buildings and from every balcony, there's potentially someone filming and broadcasting images of the conflict. So, but in the very same way that John is, uh, did it, uh, so it's a very uh, strong, still today, a very strong uh, model. Um, and I will just finish by with a short extract uh, coming uh, from uh, Eastern uh, Guta in Syria. Um, and this young man here, uh, 15 years old, uh, man is reporting uh, every day from that region, uh, so in the way of filming himself as a selfie and filming the destruction behind. And last Friday, he posted a, um, a video. So as much as the, the architecture was protecting um, journalists, or let's say uh, Western journalists, now architecture seems to be closing on citizen journalists. And that's probably uh, the kind of image we'll have to get used. And I'm, I'm questioning if, if it's a kind of a, the type of image that is signaling a new image regime where we'll have to deal with the destruction <coughs> embedded into the, into the image. <laughs> Separation. Our science happened because Western uh, 
advance of, of philosophy and science during the 1700s. So many of the things related with other cultures, like uh, Asian or cultures in Latin America or indigenous cultures are kind of out of, of that discourse. They, they never part of that. Uh, now, talking directly about if it's possible or not to talk about artificial, artificial intelligence, um, well, it depends actually on the audience, I think. Uh, if, if the audience feels some connection with that, you, you can have this conversation and you can bring it to the arts or to, to the science. And I don't know if that answers your question. I guess my question was more like, uh, do you recognize this fear of this progression of technology as something that is very uh, dictated by Western languages and like Western ideas of study? I do think yes, okay. yes, absolutely. I think that the fear that you see actually in science in general, it has to do with with all the concept of Western uh, culture in general. Does anyone else have questions? Yes. This is just a really quick question to Emmanuel. Um, I'm not sure if you know the answer, but did you ever find out why they specifically wanted you to build that while you were in the, um, in the kind of like mock-up village in the desert in America? Well, well they, they, are, they are in this um, facility. There are 13 mock villages, and only two are available to, I mean, to work on the uh, journalist. And, I mean, I, I understood that anyway, uh, any images produced from, from this uh, place was was good to them. So uh, they were really, you know, they told me maybe you will be able to to reach audiences that we we don't reach usually. And thinking of you know spectators of film festivals or art spectators, and you know, like they're really in this idea of con to conquer the, the hearts and, and minds of, of anybody. So that's how I understood that you know they were really of any type of, of camera, I didn't mean, even want to watch uh, my, my footage. Do you think, who is making those decisions by trying to reach that audience, that visual audience? Is it, well, like, what is the sector that's controlling, you know, it's a strange, like, pers perspective for the military to want to have artists coming? They, they, you know? They've been taking this into consideration since uh, a long time, uh, you know, image makers have always been part of warfare. Uh, you know, they've been, uh, at the beginning, they were hired by armies themselves to, to draw the battlefield. Uh, later, um, you know, they, 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 they joined uh, armies in '91, for example, during the first Gulf War. Um, they, they were a system of pools. Uh, only a few journalists could uh, go onto the battlefield, and many of them complained, and of course, Spectators also complain, and the, the army was accused of hiding things. And, and there's a big shift. Um, it's another media ecology that took place after that, where uh, journalists were what we call embedded uh, with, with, with the troops. Um, and of course, so the the, the, the question of, of producing and disseminating uh, representations uh, of war and controlling those images has always been uh, present. So. If you want to control, you'd rather be nice you know, to, 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 the, to the people, and there's a good chance that you know they'll, they'll report positively, positively on, the, on what you do. So it's, the, 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 there's no war without representation, uh, and one could even go as far as saying there's no uh, there's no war if there's not a representation of it. Uh, some uh, very famous uh, people uh, said that. Um, Go into this, but um, um, images are always embedded into, into this question of representing uh, warfare. We have five more minutes for QA. Does anyone have any questions? I also open it to the presenters if you have questions for each other. I just want to, uh, to react to that. You, uh, in our own museum, your museum, by the way, uh, we have uh, some uh, paintings from the 19th century. It's exactly what you said. And they were uh, one is made by De a French uh, painter, and it was uh, originally uh, part of a huge cyclorama. So it was a kind of uh, immersive uh, uh, installation uh, for 
the glory of uh, the war. Of course, okay, it was made for uh, by a French painter for uh, the French propaganda, and uh, but we also had the same uh, concerning the Napoleonic War, and uh, and also made by English uh, painter concerning. Napoleon, the master of war, even if he was the enemy. So it's a, there is a long tradition concerning the uh, propaganda uh, with uh, thanks to the image, in fact. Mm. I might have one question for Christian. Um, would you consider uh, extending your program beyond neuroscience? Uh, I'm, I'm saying that because I'm, I'm teaching in, a, in the Department of Film Studies. And, cinema production and we also try to do uh, build bridges with social sciences and architects and it's extremely difficult. I mean the, the whole uh, institution is it's made divided it scattered into departments and subgroups of research and super specific questions. It's vast but uh, could it be yeah. Go beyond. Yeah, I actually I was thinking to do what Rothkart do in Metropolis, like we want to conquer the world. Yes, we actually want to <laughs> expand to to uh, to all kinds of science. We focus in neuroscience because I, I work as a neuroscientist. Uh, and because it's easy to start to work with one subject in particular, then get people around and once this uh, proves to work, advance to the next one. So right now we are working with Concordia and uh, with uh, the Meuschi actually, and in part with McGill. But we really want with time, uh, if we get more uh, funding and more uh, people that want to work with us, expand this to neuroscience in other places and then eventually to other type of sciences too. Um, but yeah, we, we are available. If any of you guys want to talk to us or want to invite us to talk, or we are there, we are happy. You can see I'm ready. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and with that, unfortunately, we're out of time. Uh, but we'd like to thank again, once again, our wonderful professional panel for coming to speak with us. And give them a warm round of applause. <laughs> Just two short minutes to set up the next panel. And in the meantime, you can grab coffee or snacks at the back, and then we'll start.